So anyway, so so thank you uh, for uh, attending, uh, coming out, all you guys. I'm just going to share my screen here, and we're going to jump into talking about mammals. And so, all right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a lecture kind of thing, but I, I don't want it to be too super formal since it's a bit a little bit late for me. Since I know it's earlier in the day for you, you got the day ahead of you. But uh, also, I really want to make sure we have time for some discussion. So. Uh, I have a, a slide deck that I usually do uh, when I uh, give this talk, uh, but I'm, I'm going to breeze through a few things and make it a little bit less formal than I normally would to make sure that we have time for question and discussions. Anyway, so <laughs> thank you to Kyle for that intro, really kind. Um, uh, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so touched that um, I get to, to, to do this job as a paleontologist, somebody gets to dig up dinosaur bones and mammal fossils for my job. Uh, and I get to do events like this and connect with people around the world through the books that I write and through the, the fossils uh, that we discover. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, lucky, I feel, that I get to do this job here in Scotland uh, at the University of Edinburgh. I am from the Chicago area. It is a long way from Scotland. I never, ever imagined being here, uh, but it's been wonderful. I've been here about a decade. Uh, at one of the grand old universities of the world, a university that's been around since the 1580s, the university where the science of geology started. Uh, and so uh, I run a lab here. I run a, a research group in paleontology. And uh, in addition to doing field work and, and discovering and describing fossils, I like to write. I like to communicate with the public at large about these really uh, amazing uh, fossils that, that we study. And a few years back, I wrote The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. I spoke uh, to, to some of you guys before about that book. Uh, and now I've followed that up this summer with uh, a new pop science book called The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. And this book, what it does really is it takes over from the story of the dinosaurs. That asteroid came down, wiped out the dinosaurs. It spared the mammals. And among those mammals that were spared were some of our ancestors and those little ancestors built a new world. And that's the world that we know today, a world that is overrun with mammals, a world with over 6,000 species of mammals of which we are one of them. Now, what I want to uh, do in this talk, uh, and I'm going to do it quickly, but of course the whole story is in the book. Uh, I want to give you the 325 million year evolutionary story that led to us. And this story goes all the way back to when the world looked like this during a time called the Carboniferous period. And there are um, there are many ways in this which this world would have seemed like an alien world to us. Not only were the continents in totally different positions, but this was a jungle world. This was the world of the coal swamps. And they're called the coal swamps because they were these dense rainforests where you had these huge primitive trees and these things when they died, they were buried and turned to coal. And a lot of the coal that's mined in the US and in Europe was formed during this age. And it was a time where millipedes were the size of humans, where dragonflies were the size of seagulls. This, this was, was a, a remarkable time uh, in Earth history. But not everything was big and bold and brash during this time. Living in the undergrowth of these coal forests were some little reptilian looking creatures with bones. And those little animals are the start of the mammal story. Now, where I grew up in central Illinois, you could find fossils of this age. And I would collect these beautiful fossils of the plants and of the shrimps and the jellyfishes that were living off in the swamps near the, the coal forest. I would collect fossils of these uh, when I was a teenager. And here I am with my brothers you know, exploring the old coal mine spoil piles looking for these fossils in, in northern Illinois. And what I always wanted to find was the skeleton of one of these little reptilian creatures. But I never did find one because, of course, these things are so, so, so rare and they're so delicate and they're so fragile. But in other parts of North America, people have found the skeletons of animals from this age. And in particular, up in Canada, uh, a few decades ago, this animal was discovered. It's a small little thing. You could hold it in, in, in your arms. And it's a, a creature called Archaeophyrus, and it looks kind of like a chameleon or some kind of funny lizard. But what it is, it's not actually a reptile. It's something called a synapsid. It's called a synapsid because it was a member of a new group of animals that evolved during this coal swamp time that were distinguished 
because they had a hole in their head behind their eye. That's what the arrow is pointing to. Uh, and that skull on the left. Now this may seem weird having a hole in your head, but this hole, it held big jaw muscles. So these synapsids could bite really hard. Now we have a hole in our head behind our eye, the arrow in the image to the right is pointing at that. You can feel that. You put your hand on your cheekbone and you can feel there's a gap in there. That's the hole there behind your cheekbone. Those are your big jaw muscles. That's because we are a synapsid. We are part of that ancestral lineage that goes all the way back to Archaeophyrus and those coal swamps. And it is the synapsid lineage that would eventually lead to mammals. And what happened back in the coal swamps was that the little animals with bones that were living in the undergrowth, they split into two. And one side of the family tree went towards lizards and snakes and turtles and birds and crocodiles and dinosaurs. The other side went eventually a hundred million years later to mammals. But for the next hundred million years, there were a lot, a lot of primitive extinct synapsids that developed a lot of the signature features that today we recognize as the trademarks of mammals. So for a hundred million years, there were these mammal ancestors that were living. Now the coal world then changed into the next interval of time called the Permian period. The uh, continents all came together to form the supercontinent of Pangaea. And ruling that supercontinent was a whole host of ferocious animals with big sharp teeth and sails on their backs. Animals like Dimetrodon, a very famous extinct animal. Now Dimetrodon is often mistaken as a dinosaur. You see it a lot of times in dinosaur toy sets and on dinosaur posters. Uh, you see it in the new Jurassic World film that, that I worked on. It just came out this summer. But Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur. It's a synapsid. It is on the mammal line. It is more closely related to us. And it is one of those ancestors that developed some of the signature features of mammals. Now, Dimetrodon was a ferocious predator. It had these sharp uh, steak knife teeth for cutting through meat. But you can see in its jaws, those teeth don't all look the same. Some are bigger than others. And there's some little nippy ones at the front of the mouth. What you're seeing here in this distant mammal ancestor is the development of different types of teeth. And today, of course, mammals like us have incisor teeth, canine teeth, premolar teeth, molar teeth. We have this complex array of teeth that lizards don't have, that snakes don't have, that crocodiles don't have that. It's a very mammalian thing. And it was these distant ancestors that developed that kind of dentition. Now, throughout the Permian period on the supercontinent of Pangaea, there were lots of different types of synapsids. They were really the preeminent animals. They were at the top of the food chain. They were the biggest meat eaters and the biggest plant eaters. And there were lots of smaller species, too. And it looked like they would go on ruling the world forever. However, about 250 million years ago, the Permian period ended in catastrophe. These enormous volcanoes started to erupt in what is now Siberia. And this led to runaway global warming because all the carbon dioxide and methane that came out of those volcanoes. And this led to a mass extinction. It was the biggest extinction in all of Earth history. The closest life has ever come to completely dying out. And up to 95% of species perished. Most of those synapsids, like those big ferocious dimetrodon type animals, they died in this extinction. But there were a few types of synapsids that managed to eke through. And one of those types of synapsids was a little creature called a cynodont. And this is a very famous species of cynodont. It's called Thrinaxodon. And its fossils are found in abundance right after that extinction happened. And this was a small animal. You could hold it in your arms. It grew fast. It could move pretty fast. It had hair all over its body to help keep itself warm and to regulate its temperature. Oh, there's another feature of mammals. <laughs> and it could burrow down. It could dig burrows and hunker down and wait out the worst of the weather. And here's a, a CAT scan of a fossil burrow with a skeleton of one of these cynodonts inside, nestled up with an amphibian, believe it or not. Well, these cynodonts that made it through the extinction, that got through those volcanoes, they continue to develop new features that then their descendants would retain. And these cynodonts really were the next step on the way to mammals. 
And imagine that you were one of these cynodonts, like Phrynaxodon. You survived the volcanoes. The earth starts to heal. And you look out into this world in the next interval of time after the volcanoes. This is called the Triassic period. It's still the supercontinent of Pangaea, but it's now largely empty. 95% of stuff is, is dead. And so the opportunities are abundant. But it wasn't just the cynodonts that survived. There were a few other types of survivors too, including some small little reptiles. And it was those reptiles that became the dinosaurs. And it was the cynodonts that became the mammals. And dinosaurs and mammals have the same origin story. They descended from ancestors that made it through those volcanoes and then just started to diversify in the Triassic period on the supercontinent of Pangaea. Now, dinosaurs and mammals, from that point on, their fates would be forever intertwined, but their fates were different. Dinosaurs were destined for grandeur. Some of them became as, you know, bigger than Boeing 737 airplanes. Mammals did the opposite. This right here is one of the very first mammals, and it is a tiny, humble, almost forgettable little creature. These cynodonts, that survived the volcanoes, that were now having to evolve in a world where dinosaurs were getting bigger, they were relegated to the shadows. They were forced to go small. But in going small, these first mammals evolved a whole suite of new features that helped them to survive underfoot of the dinosaurs. And a lot of these things are things that we recognize today as some of the hallmarks of mammals. They're things that we ourselves have because we descended from these ancestors. Now, these first mammals, they were small. They would have looked like little mice or rats. And just to show you how small they were, at the bottom there, that is a fossil jawbone. And next to it is a grain of rice or scale. These mammals were tiny. They had to be to survive in a dinosaur world. But, again, in becoming small, they developed a lot of new signature superpowers, including the full set of incisors, canines, premolars, and molar teeth. Those teeth could then do lots of different tasks. They could grab food. They could cut food. They could chew food. This is why the teeth of our upper and lower jaws mm, lock together when we bite. They fit together precisely. That allows us to chew our food. That's a really unique thing. Lizards don't do that. Snakes don't do that, birds don't do that, but mammals can chew. Now, as part of that, the jawbone holding the teeth of the first mammals, it simplified. The ancestors of mammals had lots of little bones in their lower jaws, but mammals simplified that down to a single bone that held all the teeth to which all the muscles could connect. That allowed these mammals to chew properly, to bite really strongly. Now, in doing so, however, if you want to chew your food, really the upper and lower teeth have to come together perfectly. That won't work if you're constantly changing teeth throughout your life, like a lizard or a crocodile or a dinosaur does. And so mammals developed a new set of teeth where there's only one set of baby teeth, one set of adult teeth. That's it. And as part of that, mammals started to feed their babies a new type of food, milk. And as all of this was happening, and that single solid jawbone was, was, was coming together, all these other bones that used to be in the jaw, they didn't have a purpose anymore. They were wasting away. Some of them were recruited to a new function, and they became little bones that moved into the ear that helped to transmit sound. So these mammals developed keener senses at this time as well. And they also developed big brains and keen intelligence. The first mammals became smarter than anything else that they were living with. They had the biggest brains relative to their body size of anything else around at the time. And that's still true today, by the way. Now, all of this was happening as those first mammals were trying to survive in a dinosaur-dominated world. And we find fossils of some of these mammals living with the dinosaurs right here in Scotland at a, at a beautiful place, an island off the west coast of the country called the Isle of Skye this enchanted landscape that looks like something out of a, a fantasy novel. And I take my students there every year, and my students, here are some of them, uh, scrutinizing a new discovery. They always make the best finds. They do. They have the best eyes, and they make the best discoveries. 
And we're always on the lookout for everything, for the big dinosaurs all the way down to the tiniest little mammals that we have to look, try to find by going nose down to the rock with little magnifying glasses. Now, you can find mammals. And in the 70s, there was a school teacher who found this fossil. It may not look like a lot. It may look like a bit of roadkill. But for a long time, this was one of the only skeletons of a mammal from the age of dinosaurs. For a long time, for centuries, we knew hardly anything about the mammals living with dinosaurs. We had just little bits and pieces here and there. That has now changed over the last 25 years because of some stunning discoveries in China. Way up in northeastern China, far off the tourist trail, in a place called Liaoning Province. It shares a long border with North Korea. It's a land of factories, of rolling hills, of farmland. And about 25 years ago, some farmers out working their fields started to find fossils that looked like these, these exquisite skeletons of dinosaurs with feathers on their bodies, the things that prove that birds evolved from dinosaurs, preserved in such pristine detail because their ecosystems were buried by volcanoes, almost Pompeii style, and that locked in the fossils. And because of that, the entire ecosystems are preserved. It's not just the dinosaurs. There's plants, there's fish, there's insects, there's pterodactyls and lizards and frogs and turtles, and there are mammals found at these sites in China. And here I am a few years ago at a museum in China in the back room as the curators brought out a new fossil that a farmer had just brought in, a fossil of a tiny little animal just about the size of a mouse with hair all around his body, a fossil mammal. And these things are absolutely gorgeous. And the more the farmers look, the more they find. And these fossils, which come from the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, the next two intervals of the age of dinosaurs, these fossils tell us that mammals were a lot more interesting during the time of dinosaurs than we used to think. It is true that during this time, 150 million years, mammals lived with dinosaurs and mammals never got bigger than a house cat. That part is true. The dinosaurs did make it so the mammals couldn't get very big. The dinosaurs kept the mammals small. But the more we learn from these fossils in China, we can see the mammals did the opposite. They kept the dinosaurs big. And by that, I mean, you, you never saw a T-Rex the size of a mouse or a Triceratops the size of a rat. No, 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 because mammals filled those small ecological niches and they did it so well. There were mammals at that time that were scurriers, that were climbers, that were diggers, that were swimmers. There were even mammals that had wings of skin that they used to glide between the trees. And some mammals, like this one here in China, this one is one of the biggest mammals of the time. It's about the size of a cat. <clears throat> this mammal was buried by the volcanoes. It was buried so quickly that its last meal was preserved in its stomach. And that last meal was a baby dinosaur. So this was a mammal that ate dinosaurs for breakfast. <laughs> so what this all means is that mammals were actually much more interesting during the time of dinosaurs than we used to think. They were small, they had to be small, the T-Rexes and Brontosauruses, they occupied the large sizes, but in being small, in living anonymously, in living incognito, the mammals proliferate. And we keep learning more about them. We do field work in Romania, which is an incredible place to find fossils. We literally have to pluck the fossils out of these riverbeds. And there's a lot of mammals there that come from the Cretaceous period. And a lot of these mammals are a totally extinct group called multi-tuberculates. And they were diversifying as a new food source was diversifying as well. And that food source was flowering plants plants with fruits and flowers. And believe it or not, a brontosaurus, a stegosaurus would have never seen a flower because flowering plants came late in evolution. They only started in the Cretaceous period. Now today there's flowering plants everywhere. Most of our food that we eat comes from flowering plants. But back in the Cretaceous, these mammals started to eat the new flowering plants they proliferate. And that's how things stood more or less until 66 million years ago, the continents moved around, Pangaea broke up, the continents started to look like they, more or less like they did today, and then 66 million years ago, one random Saturday afternoon, let's say, 
this six mile wide rock fell out of the sky. It was an asteroid traveling faster than a speeding bullet. It smashed into the earth with the force of over a billion nuclear bombs put together and it unleashed chaos. Tsunamis and wildfires and earthquakes and the dust and the dirt and the grime and the soot all went up into the atmosphere and blocked out the sun and the earth was plunged into darkness for maybe up to a decade and the, the, the forests collapsed and the plant eaters had no food and the meteors had no food and ecosystems imploded like houses of cards. Dinosaurs were there and mammals were there when that asteroid hit. In fact, T-Rex itself was there. Triceratops itself was there when the asteroid hit. But those dinosaurs, they could not make it through. They had ruled the Earth for 150 million years. But all of a sudden, the things that had given them such advantages in the world before, they were now hindrances during this time of bedlam. Dinosaurs were too big. It, they, it took them too long to grow from a baby into an adult. Most dinosaurs couldn't hide very easily. Most dinosaurs had very specialized diets. They were not primed to succeed during an unexpected and sudden period of chaos, but mammals were. Those little mammals that for so long had had to endure in the shadow of the dinosaurs, they had what it took. They were small. They grew fast. They reproduced fast. They could hide easily. They could burrow. They could eat lots of different foods. That was the winning hand of cards to get through the asteroid. And it's a, a stunning thing to think about, kind of an eerie thing to think about, but we had ancestors that stared down that asteroid. And if we didn't have those ancestors, we wouldn't be here today. Now, a lot of my work uh, over the last uh, decade or so has focused on New Mexico. New Mexico is one of the best places in the world for discovering fossils of the very last dinosaurs and the mammals that took over. And I bring my students out to New Mexico Here's Sarah, my very first PhD student in Edinburgh. She's now one of the world experts on the mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. And we find a lot of their fossils in New Mexico. And these fossils tell us a few really important things. First of all, very quickly after the asteroid, it becomes a mammal-dominated world. There's tons of new species of mammals that, that start to form very diverse ecosystems. Secondly, those mammals are a lot bigger than they were before. Remember, for 150 million years, mammals lived with dinosaurs. Mammals never got larger than a house cat. But now, within a few hundred thousand years of the asteroid, we have fossils of mammals the size of pigs. Within one or two million years, fossils of mammals the size of cows. And from there, mammals would keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The third thing we see is that these mammals that are proliferating in New Mexico, so soon after the asteroid, they are one particular type of mammal. They are placental mammals, those like us that give live birth to well-developed babies. So the vast majority of mammals today, whether it's us or monkeys or dogs or cats or bats or whales or elephants are all placental mammals. The other mammals are things like marsupials that give birth to tiny little babies that they raise further in pouches. These are things like kangaroos and possums. And then there's only a few monotremes, these very primitive mammals that still lay eggs. But the vast majority of today's mammals are placentals, and this is because placentals are the ones that blossomed right after the extinction, leading to the 6,000 plus species today. Now, we don't know a whole lot about those placentals that emerge right after the extinction. We are learning a lot of new things about them from all of these fossils we're finding in New Mexico. It's still a big mystery where they fit on the family tree mammals. We know they're placental, but beyond that, we don't know very much about them. But we're starting to learn quite a lot about them. We're learning more about their intelligence and their senses. And this is Ornella, who is a postdoc who works in my lab. Ornella has cat scanned a lot of the skulls of these mammals, and, that, and she uses the x-rays of the CAT scanner to see inside the skulls and build digital models of the brain, kind of like a medical doctor does. And what Ornella found is really interesting that these mammals, these placental mammals living right after the extinction, they, their bodies got so big so fast that their brains couldn't keep pace. So the size of the brain in relation to the body actually got smaller in the 10 million years after the extinction. In other words, these placental mammals that took over from the dinosaurs, 
They did it by getting dumber. <laughs> so it wasn't huge brains that really helped them. Bigger brains came later. It was getting bigger in overall size that was more important. The second thing we're starting to see, and this is a study that we just published last week. It was led by Greg here, who is a postdoc in my lab. We published it in Nature. Uh, and Onella's paper, by the way, was published in Science earlier this year. These are our scientific journals. But Greg's paper really just literally hot off the presses. Greg has you he's made very thin slices of teeth to look under the microscope. There's daily growth lines in teeth that allows you to tell uh, a chronology of the life of one of these mammals. And there, if you measure the chemistry across those growth lines, there are chemical markers of birth and of weaning. So Greg was able to tell that some of these mammals living right after the extinction, they raised their babies for seven months in the womb. Those babies drank milk for one or two months afterwards. Then they weaned onto solid food. And then within a year, they started making their own babies. So it was being able to grow fast, but also to give birth to big babies that developed a long time in the womb. These things were keys that allowed these placental mammals to get really big and to take over from the dinosaurs. But there's still a lot to learn about these mammals that were living right after the extinction. If you go about 10 million years after the extinction, things start to look a lot more familiar to us. And we see this in this famous fossil site in Germany. It's a big hole in the ground where they used to mine oil. They, they mined shale that they took oil out of. And when the mines closed, this almost became a garbage dump. But instead, it was turned into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And why was that? Because in the shale rock where the oil is found are also a lot of fossils, exquisitely preserved fossil mammals that fell into an ancient lake about 55 million years ago. And these mammals are ones that are familiar to us. These are obviously placental mammals, and they're obviously members of today's major placental groups. There are things like horses and things like primates but they're a little bit different. The primates don't quite look like the monkeys of today. They're a bit more primitive. The horses are really different. They're tiny. These are the first horses of all, and they're just about the size of a poodle. But later on during this interval, which is called the Eocene interval, mammals continued to modernize, and some of them became sublime. And there were some mammals that started to look like they were trying to become dinosaurs. And these include some of the largest mammals that have ever lived on land, including this thing on the bottom here, Paraceratherium. It was a rhino, a rhino without horns, but a rhino nonetheless. And it weighed close to 20 tons, the biggest mammal that has ever lived on land. Meanwhile, during the Eocene interval, a couple groups of mammals started to do some really unusual things. One group of mammals turned their hands into wings and took to the skies. And we see the first fossils of bats. And of course, bats persist today. They are some of the most incredible mammals of all. They're the only mammals that, that can use powered flight, that flap their wings to generate lift. Only birds and pterodactyls are the only other animals with bones that have ever done that. And so bats developed the superpower and it allowed them to become the first group of mammals to properly spread all over the world. At the same time, another group of mammals started to undergo its own really peculiar transition. This is an animal called Pachycetus. It maybe has the general bearing of a dog or a wolf. If you look at it, long snout, sharp teeth. But look at those arms and legs. They end in hands and feet that look kind of like scuba divers paddles. And believe it or not, this animal here is one of the very first whales. It was a whale that could walk because the ancestors of whales lived on land. Whales and dolphins are mammals that evolved from land living ancestors and moved into the water. And this was all happening during the Eocene interval. And importantly, we have a beautiful sequence of fossils, of transitional fossils, that show step by step by step how an ancestor that looked like a tiny little deer, an ancestor with hooves, a fast runner on land, how an animal that looked like Bambi turned into Moby Dick. And of course, whales persist today. And we start to see some of the first modern whales 
fossils of absolute ocean living behemoths in Egypt, where there are these just otherworldly looking skeletons eroding out of the Sahara Desert. These are the first truly giant whales. And today, giant whales are a major part of our world. And believe it or not, it's a fact that um, I think we don't always cherish or don't always appreciate. The biggest animals that have ever lived are mammals, not dinosaurs. They're mammals. They are whales. And in particular, the blue whale shown here, this is the largest thing that has ever lived in the history of the Earth. And it is alive right now. We share our world with it. And I think we take that for granted. I think if blue whales were extinct and all we had were some of their petrified bones, we would hold them in as much esteem as we hold the dinosaurs. So let's conserve them. Let's cherish them. Let's appreciate them for what we are. Just look at how big they are. This is a colleague of mine standing next to a blue whale skull. This guy would be a piece of popcorn to that whale. And they are still with us in our world. Now, the first whales, the first bats, and a lot of these other, you know, horses and primates and so on, they were evolving in a world that looked like this. It was pretty modern looking. But there were a few continents that today are connected to other continents, but at that time were island continents. They were fortresses unto themselves. And one of them was Africa. And it was on Africa where a really quirky group evolved in isolation. The elephants, and they evolved from small little ancestors, barely bigger than a lap dog. And they would become in time some of the very largest mammals to ever live on land. In South America, meanwhile, South America was way off on its own. It was only about two and a half million years ago that South America bumped up against North America and connected through the Isthmus of Panama. Until then, South America was on its own for tens of millions of years. And it incubated some very peculiar mammals while it was in isolation. And some of these flabbergasted Charles Darwin himself. When Darwin sailed on the Beagle, he would drop port all along the coast in South America. He would go inland. He collected fossils. And he collected a lot of fossils of these really strange mammals. They seem like Frankenstein creature mashups, a little bit of elephant, a little bit of rodent, a little bit of horse. He didn't know what to make of them. And it was only a few years ago that we finally identified what they are, because they're all extinct today. But some fossil DNA was found in some of their bones, and that showed through the DNA paternity test that these things were close relatives of horses. They were a strange type of horse that found their way down to South America, became marooned there, and then evolved and, 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 and just d produced all of these strange new species in isolation. Now, during this time, when all of this was happening, everything I'm talking about here, bats and whales and the strange African and South American mammals, this was a, a, a jungle world, a hothouse world. It was warm, really warm. The tropics and the subtropics, that sort of climate covered much of the earth. And that means there were a lot of jungles all over the earth. But then during the Oligocene interval after the Eocene, the global temperature started to change. And it all had to do with changes in ocean currents and changes in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what that meant was the jungles started to, to decline, and they started to dry up into little bubbles of jungle, and they were replaced by open space. And filling that open space were plants that could grow quickly and were really resistant to the cool temperatures and the dryness that comes with cool temperatures. And these were a relatively new type of plant the type of plant called grass. And although it may seem odd to us because grass is such an integral part of our world, grasses, the first grasses only evolved at the very end of the age of dinosaurs, but they were very marginal plants. It was only in the Oligocene interval that grasses started to spread and you started to see the first proper grasslands, the first savannas, prairies, whatever you'd like to call them. Again, those are very common ecosystems today, but they were a very new invention of Earth history. And about 12 million years ago, in the time after the Oligocene, which was called the Miocene, grassland spread across much of the northern part of the world, North America, Europe, and Asia, 
a lot of North America was covered in grasslands, and you could go on safari in Nebraska at that time. There were rhinos and camels and horses and elephants living in Nebraska and across much of America. And a lot of their fossils are found in this beautiful fossil site called the Ashfall Fossil Beds, where the Yellowstone volcano, when it erupted about 12 million years ago, it buried an entire herd of these rhinos in ash. Now, a lot of these safari type animals, they evolved to live on the open plains. They, they grew hooves and they started to run very fast and they evolved new types of teeth that they could use to eat the grasses. And then meanwhile, there are lots of different groups of meat eaters that evolved to take advantage of those new plant eaters. And these meat eaters became specialists at ambushing or chasing prey in the open spaces. Dogs and cats, you know, they traced their ancestry to this time. But there were some extinct groups, too, that were even more terrifying, like these uh, so-called bear dogs. There were also things that we call hell pigs, these enormous, gnarly, wild boar-type animals. These were the top predators of those savannas. But that's what was happening in North America and in Europe and Asia during that time. Now, down in Australia, things were very different. I haven't said much about Australia yet because Australia was an island continent at the time, and it has continued to be an island continent. While South America and Africa have moved northwards and they docked with the northern continents, Australia has stayed on its own. And the grasslands came much more recently to Australia. And during much of the time I've been talking about, Australia remained subtropical and covered with rainforest. And it was full of mammals, but very different mammals than anything I've been talking about. And there's a fossil site out in the outback, a place called Riversleep, where these teams of paleontologists, they literally explode through this hard rock with explosives to liberate the fossils within. And a lot of these are gorgeous fossils and these are mammal fossils, but these are not dogs or cats or elephants or whales or bats or primates or anything like that. They are marsupial mammals. They are some of those peculiar mammals, part of that group that gives birth to tiny little babies that they raise in pouches. Now, it turns out marsupials were pretty widespread across the northern continents during the final part of the age of dinosaurs. But then when the asteroid hit, they nearly all went extinct. But some of them escaped south down to South America where they proliferated. And there still are a lot of marsupials in South America today. And, and the single marsupial in North America, the possum, is a very recent immigrant from South America. But other marsupials found their way to Australia. And Australia was really so far on the edge of the world that those marsupials were able to evolve in splendid isolation. And they produced a whole bevy of species, koalas and kangaroos and wallabies and so on. A lot of the, the, the very iconic, quirky Australian mammal fauna of today, but also there were a lot of extinct species, even predatory marsupials, things that looked a lot like lions or wolves that lived until quite recently. Now, eventually, the grasslands did come to Australia as global temperature continued to get cooler and drier. And then about two and a half million years ago, the temperature became even colder, and that's when the world tipped into an ice age. But not just any ice age. This is what we call the ice age. And really, the ice age uh, has been a series of roller coaster changes in climate. Times when the temperature gets colder and the polar ice caps grow in size and they extend down onto the continents. And then times when the temperature warms a little bit and those ice caps crawl back, back and forth and back and forth in concert with that waltz of global temperature change. Now, technically, we are still in the Ice Age, by the way. It was only about 10,000 years ago that we came out of the last glacial period when those ice caps extended far onto the continent. Now, during the Ice Age was when a lot of the most charismatic and famous extinct mammals lived. And these were things like mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, the Ice Age megafauna. And there were lots of giant mammals that lived during the Ice Age and really went extinct quite recently, just about 10,000 years ago. Not only mammoths and mastodons and saber-toothed tigers, but woolly rhinoceroses, armadillos the size of Volkswagens, 
deer with antlers the size of, of dinner tables, cave hyenas, American lions, beavers the size of humans, wombats that weighed three tons in Australia, kangaroos that were too plump to hop. Just spectacular, spectacular mammals. And they captivate us today, but they have captivated people really for thousands of years. And in the late 1700s and early 1800s, they particularly captivated Thomas Jefferson, of all people. And in 1797, less than a week after Jefferson was inaugurated as the second vice president, after this very contentious election with John Adams to see who would succeed George Washington, less than a week after Jefferson became the vice president when Adams won the presidency, Jefferson stood up in front of a scientific conference in Philadelphia and read out a research paper describing the bones of a giant mammal found in Virginia. And at first he thought this was an extinct lion. He later came to understand it was an enormous type of sloth. Now sloths today, they're cute, they're cuddly, they hang from the trees, these lazy little animals. But back during the ice age, there were sloths that stood 10 feet tall. And Jefferson became infatuated with them. And these sloths became part of a much bigger debate. Why aren't there giant mammals today like this? Or are there still giant mammals today? Jefferson thought, yes, these things must still be alive. Why did he think that? He thought that species could not possibly go extinct because it would, it would, it would not be the plan of a perfect creator. So Jefferson felt that these mastodons and mammoths and giant sloths, that they once lived in eastern North America, and then they moved their range out west, and they were still alive somewhere out west in some unexplored valley. And he actually sent Lewis and Clark out on their expedition with the express purpose, one of, one of their tasks, in addition to mapping the continent and meeting Native American tribes and so on, one of their tasks was to find living giant sloths and woolly mammoths. But they didn't. And over time, even Jefferson himself came to understand that these animals really did go extinct. They were once alive, they are no longer alive. And it was only in the early 1800s that scientists as a whole came to grasp that extinction was something that could happen. So there are no mammoths anymore, no giant ground sauce. What happened to them? Well, most of them died about 10,000 years ago. And the reason, the most likely reason for this is us. Our Homo sapiens ancestors knew these animals, encountered these animals, hunted these animals, painted pictures of these animals on cave walls. And as humans marched across the world, the giant mammals often went extinct soon after in their wake. Now, climates were changing at this time too. We were coming out of the ice age, so that could have played a role, but really, if there were no humans, probably a lot of these giant mammals would still be around. Now, our human story began about six million years ago in Africa when a group of apes came down from the tree, started to walk upright on their hind legs. After that, their hands were freed to do new things, to build tools, to hunt. And that allowed these humans to have a, a, a much greater diet, to take in more calories, to be able to communicate with each other better. Our brains got bigger. And many different species of fossil humans proliferated alongside each other, first in Africa, but then they left Africa in many successive waves. And our species, Homo sapiens, uh, originated about 300,000 years ago in Africa. And a bit after that, it started to move outside of Africa. And when our species left Africa and went up into Europe, into the land of the ice, it would have encountered another different species of human, the Neanderthals. And in fact, there were dozens of species of fossil humans that once lived. And up until 40,000 years ago, it was a normal thing for there to be multiple species of humans living at the, at the same time, even living in the same place. And that sounds totally odd to us because although there's like 8 billion humans on the planet today, we are all the same species. But back then there were different species. And really it does make sense. There's many different types of cats in today's world. There many types of rodents. So back then there were many types of humans. 
up until about 40,000 years ago. That's when Neanderthals went extinct. And why did they go extinct? Well, probably because of us. But we were able to interbreed with them. And a few percent of most of our genes are actually Neanderthal genes. But Neanderthals met their end as Homo sapiens really began to spread around the world. And humans, our human species left Africa, went to Europe, went to Asia, got to Australia, eventually got to North America, got to South America, covered the whole world. And then not too long ago, we started to migrate even further afield. And who knows how far we will go. But as we dream of an interstellar existence, we must confront a, a worrying situation at home. And that is that right now is probably the most perilous time in the history of mammals ever since our ancestors stared down that asteroid. Since our human species, Homo sapiens, has been moving around the world, about 350 species of our fellow mammals have gone extinct, and many more are endangered. And this is largely because of us. It's because we hunt these animals, because we clear land to plant our crops. It's because we change the climate, the temperatures, the environments. We are one sublime species of mammals that has evolved this ability to affect all of our other mammalian cousins to such a degree. But we also have been endowed by evolution with big brains, with consciousness, with the ability to work together in groups. And so I am hopeful that we will use the fossil record, this 325 million year history of our ancestors to understand all of the things mammals have been through, to give us perspective and to help us prepare for a better future in which we are more resilient to climate and environmental change, in which we can conserve ourselves and our mammalian cousins. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I am very happy to take uh, any questions. So thank you and cheers. Thank you so much for that, Steve. Uh, that, was, that was a really fascinating talk. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can while we still have some time left. Yes, um, we've got 10 minutes and I, I'll take whatever I can. And if I don't have a chance to get through everything by the top of the hour, um, my uh, email is pretty easy to find. So please do drop me a message. And then, uh, of course, it goes without saying, but this was just a little teaser and all the answers, of course, can be found in the book, which you can find at any good library <laughs> and in any good local bookshop. <laughs> Uh, well, so in the meantime, I have some questions for you. Um, so I'm sure you get this one all the time as a paleontologist, but I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts on the, the prospect of bringing back the woolly mammoth? Of course, I've used quotes because it wouldn't really be a woolly mammoth, but uh, what, what do you think of that? I know that there's some researchers who are really interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I won't pretend to know the mechanics of doing that because I'm not a geneticist and, you know, very quickly it becomes a, a you know, very different, very highly technical field. Uh, what I will say is that, um, you know, ever since Jurassic Park came out as a book and as a film, you know, <laughs> people have been wondering if we could bring back dinosaurs. And, you know, as a scientist, I never say never. Um, that's the worst thing a scientist could do. You start closing your mind off to possibilities if you say something's impossible. So I'm not going to say bringing back a dinosaur is impossible, but it seems very implausible. And that's simply because we've never found any dinosaur DNA, you know, not even a little bit. Uh, and of course, I mean, every paleontologist would love to be the first person to find dinosaur DNA, but nobody's done it because it's so hard. DNA breaks down so quickly once an animal dies. But a woolly mammoth is a whole different ballgame because woolly mammoths, they went extinct actually only about 4,000 years ago. There were some populations that persisted on islands. Most of them went extinct about 10,000 years ago. That's not very long. Plus, we still find frozen carcasses of woolly mammoths in Siberia, in Alaska, in the permafrost. You know, these not just the bones, but the muscles, the skin, the hair. Uh, we had we through these these frozen cadavers um geneticists have sequenced the entire woolly mammoth genome we know every gene that a woolly mammoth had we know more about the woolly mammoth genetics than we do about most living species of mammals and woolly mammoths are very close relatives of indian elephants and A asian elephants and in fact woolly mammoths and asian elephants are more closely related to each other 
than either one is to an African elephant. So an Indian elephant, an Asian elephant, could maybe be a mother, you know, host species for a clone. So for those reasons, I think it is actually quite plausible that, that a mammoth could be resurrected. Uh, and then you get into, okay, if you can do it, should you do it? <laughs> you get into the ethics. That's a whole different uh, kettle of fish there. I would say in one sense, you know, the earth now is very different than the earth the woolly mammoths knew. The earth is much warmer. You know, the environments are much different. So in a way, a mammoth would be like an alien in today's world. However, on the flip side, we probably killed the mammoth. So would bringing back the mammoth be some penance, you know, for that sin? I don't know. So I don't have a firm answer to the ethics, but that's just a little bit of my thought process about the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, if, in, even in our modern era where most of us humans don't have to hunt to survive and we can just go to the, the grocery store and get our food, are we still evolving in our modern sedentary existence? We certainly are evolving. Uh, we're evolving culturally, no doubt, uh, and we're evolving physically uh, as well. Um, some of that is through natural selection. Um, uh, so some of that, you know, we can't quite see just on our normal time scales. And really, you need to look generation by generation over a long stretch of time to really see the, the changes that happen. But, but I have no doubt we are evolving. I have no doubt we'll continue to evolve. Um, and as the Earth gets warmer, um, that's going to put certain stresses and strains, you know, on us. And we will have to adapt in an evolutionary sense. Uh, in order to do that. And one thing that a lot of mammals do, we see this in the fossil record, a lot of times when temperatures go up, mammals get smaller. They dwarf in size. Uh, when there was this big global warming event about 55 million years ago, about 40% of mammals got smaller. So not all mammals do it, but quite a lot of them do. And that's just because smaller mammals, uh, it, it's harder for them to overheat and they can shed body heat easier than a bigger mammal. Uh, so maybe as temperatures uh, rise, um, maybe over many generations, over I'm talking about over tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, you know, humans maybe might get smaller. Maybe. These are the kind of things that we can at least think about and we can use the fossil record to give us some guidance for some possibilities. That is fascinating to think about. And also, we had someone mention that the uh, the chat was disabled. I, I apologize. That was a setting I didn't realize. So if anyone has comments, feel free to use the chat. But if you have questions, I encourage you to use the Q&A just because it's a bit easier for us to monitor those. Um, so let's see. So I uh, have another question for you here. So you showed this slide with an illustration of some of the earliest kind of horse-like mammals. Uh, there was one in particular that just looked really weird looking, and I want to hear more about is mm -hmm. I, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but Shalicotherus? <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought this was going to be the one you're going to ask. Yes. Yeah. Um, these are things called calicotheres, and um, they are extinct. Uh, however, the, the last surviving ones lived within the last few hundred thousand years. So our ancestors probably did encounter them. Um, they were hoofed mammals and they were members of the the horse family they weren't horses but they were close cousins of horses uh, they don't really look like horses or they kind of look like maybe what would happen if a horse and a gorilla were able to, to mate um, so these things were big they were ponderous they had very very long arms uh, they kind of walked a bit like a gorilla they would have knuckle walked they had big heads they had probably very long tongues they would eat plants from the from the the trees they would strip the, the branches um, really odd animals the kind of thing that if we didn't have fossils we would never know that something like that existed but at the same time probably not that much weirder than say a giraffe you know imagine if there we were in a world where giraffes were extinct and all we had were fossils we'd say wow those are really weird um, so probably if the uh, calicotheres were still here they would probably be some of the most um, uh, entertaining zoo animals of all. <laughs> People would love them. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd certainly love to see one. Um, so are, are whales the oldest mammals that still exist today? Or, or, or what, what you know, mammal that currently exists in its modern form has been here the longest? 
Um, it's hard to say. I mean, as far as like a single given species, I don't know. I mean, most species don't last for that long. Maybe they last a few million years, but the bigger groups can last for much longer. Um, the, the, group of, the group of mammals that's kind of the most archaic are the monotremes, the, the platypus and the echidnas, the ones that still lay eggs. And they are basically holdovers from a group, an ancient group that was once widespread across the southern continents during the time of dinosaurs. And almost all of them died out, but really just, I think, through the quirks of fate, a few species managed to hold on in Australia and in some of the islands around Australia, way off in the corner of the world. You could imagine an alternative universe where, you know, that line was snipped by extinction and we wouldn't know anything about them today. You could also imagine another alternative universe where another one of these archaic mammal groups, like some of those ones with the wings of skin that live with the dinosaurs, where one or two species continue to today, and we still have them. That's kind of what we're at uh, with those, those monotremes. Um, so uh, I think those are the most peculiar animals, and they're certainly kind of the most archaic. Um, mm -hmm. And just to say, we're coming at the top of the hour. I'm going to have to get back to family time here. So if there's one final question, I can take it. Otherwise, please do, you know, send me an, a message if anybody has anything they want to ask and, or any feedback on the book. Or sure. Well, uh, yeah, we are running out of time. So uh, we did have a, just a comment here from someone saying that, Steve, your enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, our <laughs> book club read both of your books and we're both. Oh, reading. thank you. <laughs> Your writing style and live presentation style are exceptional. Keep researching and writing about it. Too. Well, I appreciate I love hearing that. That's exactly what I love to hear kind of late on Saturday night, you know, as the days winded down that your your book clubs read both of the books. How cool. Well, please do thank everybody in your book club. Um, tell them I say hi. Uh, and I'm just reading it. So that's Judy. So Judy, yes. Yeah, so hi to you, Judy. And, and please do pass along my greetings to everybody in, in the book club. And with that... Um, uh, I should make my entrance. I'll just say, in my exit, I'll say that I, I see the next um, uh, just quick comment here as well about, uh, oh, okay, patron, your zoology undergrad. Awesome for you. Keep in touch, uh, please. And um, everybody, sorry to run, but uh, we uh, have family time now. So um, I hope we cross paths again. Kyle, thanks as always for making these things happen. And um, best of luck to everybody. And um, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. We appreciate your time. Thanks again, Steve. Have All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Take care. Yeah. Bye.